Grammar Girl here. Who's your friendly guide to the English language? I am. We talk about writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, we'll talk about how to use single quotation marks and double quotation marks, and why you should have a house style guide. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Hallmark Cards. Lately, I've been getting really into sending Hallmark birthday cards. I just want something that goes beyond happy birthday. A Hallmark card will make your loved one actually feel special. See what a card can do. Visit hallmark.com slash grammar to shop a wide variety of birthday cards and use the promo code grammar to get 20% off your card purchase. That's hallmark.com slash grammar and the code grammar. And now on to single quotation marks versus double quotation marks. Most people think of double quotation marks as being for quotations, which they are, but they also have other legitimate uses. For example, double quotation marks are often used around the title of a short work, such as a magazine article or an episode of a TV show. The Darmok and Gillard at Tanagra episode of Star Trek Next Generation is one of my favorites. And if you're writing that out and following a style that says you use quotation marks around the title of a TV show episode, you'd put quotation marks around Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. The rules for longer works, such as books, are tricky. The Associated Press uses quotation marks, but the Chicago Manual of Style and the MLA Handbook recommend italics. People sometimes use double quotation marks to indicate that a word is special in some way. I bet you've all seen quotation marks used as something called scare quotes, which are quotation marks put around a word to show that the writer doesn't buy in to the meaning. For example, I could write the sentence, women achieved, quote, equality, unquote, when they were granted the right to vote in 1920. That would indicate that although women getting the right to vote was heralded as equality at the time, I don't think it was enough of a gain to merit the word equality. More often, though, scare quotes, which are also sometimes called sneer quotes, are used to impart a sense of irony or disdain. They're especially common in nasty political commentary, as in politicians, quote, care, unquote, about their constituents. Double quotation marks can also be used when you're writing a sentence and you want to refer to a word rather than use its meaning. Since I talk about words a lot, this comes up in almost every Grammar Girl episode. It's a style choice. You can use italics or double quotation marks to highlight words, but we use quotation marks on the Grammar Girl site. A common mistake, though, is to use quotation marks to simply highlight a word in a sentence. The popular blog of unnecessary quotation marks, rest in peace, did nothing but mock signs that misuse quotation marks in this way. For example, if you're promoting your gluten-free cookies and you put gluten-free in quotation marks, that actually means they have gluten. Stick with underlining or italics or bold to highlight words. Moving on to single quotation marks, the most common reason to use them is to quote someone who's quoting someone else. The rules are different in British English, but in American English, you enclose the primary speaker's comments in double quotation marks, and then you enclose the thing they are quoting in single quotation marks. You nest them with the double quotation marks on the outside and the single quotation marks on the inside. For example, imagine you've interviewed Aardvark for a magazine article about his harrowing ordeal with an arrow, and he said, Squiggly saved my life when he yelled, Watch out, Aardvark! That whole part that Aardvark said, Squiggly saved my life when he yelled, Watch out, Aardvark, is in double quotation marks. And then the part he's quoting Squiggly as saying, Watch out, Aardvark, is in single quotation marks. If you're ever in the extremely rare position of having to nest another quotation inside a sentence like that, you'd use double quotation marks again for the third nested quotation. You can find many articles that say British English uses single quotation marks around a direct quotation instead of double quotation marks. And although doing so is more common in British English than in American English, it doesn't seem to be a hard and fast rule. I found many British news sites that use double quotation marks just like an American site would, 
including The Guardian, The Sunday Times, The Sun, and the BBC. It seems like using single quotation marks is more of an option in British English than a prevailing style. And in Britain, they also sometimes call them inverted commas. It can be hard to see a single quotation mark that's followed by a double quotation mark when they fall right next to each other like they did in the last example. So typesetters sometimes insert something called a thin space between the two quotation marks. A thin space is just what it sounds like, a space that's thinner than a regular space. Another place you'll see single quotation marks a lot is in headlines, in newspapers, and on websites. That's because the Associated Press uses single quotation marks for quotations in headlines. Finally, it's the convention in certain disciplines, such as philosophy, theology, and linguistics, to highlight words with special meaning by using single quotation marks instead of double quotation marks. Also, a frequent point of confusion is the difference between the words quote and quotation. Quote is a verb that means to repeat what someone else has said or written. For example, aardvark quoted squiggly. Quotation is a noun used to describe what you are quoting, as in Squiggly's quotation was inspiring. It's common to hear people use the noun quote as a shortened form of quotation, as in I filled my notebook with quotes from The Daily Show. But that's technically wrong. It should be I filled my notebook with quotations from The Daily Show. I agree that the correct way sounds a bit pretentious, and given that a lot of reference sources have extra entries discussing how the misuse is widespread, you aren't going to sound illiterate if you use quote incorrectly, but it's still good to know the difference. So, to sum up, in American English, use double quotation marks to surround a quotation. In British English, you can use single or double quotation marks for that. If you write for a company or publication, check your style guide. If you need to put a quotation inside your first quotation, use the opposite type of quotation marks to surround it. That's single quotation marks in American English. Double quotation marks can also be used to show sarcasm or to identify words used as words instead of for their meaning. Single quotation marks are often used in headlines and in some disciplines to highlight words with special meanings. Today's episode is supported by the Waterpik Whitening Water Flosser. If you drink coffee, tea, or red wine, it can be hard to keep your teeth stain-free. Restore your natural bright smile with the Waterpik Whitening Water Flosser. It removes 25% more stains than brushing alone. The Waterpik Flosser is the perfect solution for anyone looking to restore a great smile without harsh bleaching chemicals or expensive whitening treatments. It's nothing like the kind of flossing you're used to, which, let's face it, is kind of the worst part of anyone's routine. I love the Waterpik Whitening Water Flosser because it's so easy to use. I can reach the back teeth in my mouth without, like, opening up so wide and reaching all the way in. It's just so much more comfortable. And it takes just one minute to use the Waterpik Whitening Water Flosser. And unlike string floss, it actually feels nice to use. Receive $30 off a Waterpik Whitening Water Flosser for yourself at waterpik.com slash grammar and enter the code grammar. That's W-A-T-E-R-P-I-K dot com slash grammar with the code grammar for $30 off. Today's show is also sponsored by Native Deodorant. Native creates safe, simple, and effective products that people use every day. Their products are filled with trusted ingredients, and their natural deodorant is no exception. Native deodorant is formulated without aluminum, parabens, and talc, and with ingredients found in nature. Simple ingredients you understand, like coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch. It comes in a wide variety of enticing scents for men and women. Their classic deodorant scents include coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, and eucalyptus and mint. And they release new, limited-edition seasonal scents all year long. Making the switch to a natural deodorant doesn't mean having to sacrifice on odor and wetness protection. Native is proof of that. There's a reason it has more than 9,000 five-star reviews. There's also no risk to try it. Native offers free shipping and free returns and exchanges in the USA. I like that I can feel good about Native ingredients, and I love the way it smells, especially the coconut and vanilla. 
For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use the promo code GG during checkout. That's nativedeodorant.com and the promo code GG for 20% off your first purchase. One of our listeners wrote in recently to ask whether you capitalize the prefix non in the phrase non-federal sponsors. We replied that it depended on what her house style was for federal. If her company capitalized the word federal, then non would be capitalized too. Her reply was, thanks, but what do you mean by house style? So here's an explanation. As you might know, most of the so-called rules we follow when we're writing and editing aren't rules at all. They're actually a collection of choices related to grammar, punctuation, spelling, and formatting, like a lot of the things we just talked about with quotation marks. These choices, which can vary by industry and country, are collected in major style guides like the Chicago Manual of Style, the AP Style Book, and the Publication Manual of the American Psychological Association. And as we said a couple of weeks ago in the segment on the plural of quid pro quo, the online BuzzFeed style guide often has good advice for internet and pop culture terms that other style guides don't have. These guides address a vast range of questions that come up when you're writing or editing. For example, whether you capitalize or lowercase certain words, whether you hyphenate compound words, close them up, or set them as two separate words when you spell out numbers and when you use numerals, when you abbreviate certain terms and when you spell them out, what punctuation you use in bulleted and numbered lists, how you format indexes, reference lists, and text citations, and how you format the names of books, magazines, websites, TV shows, and the like. Despite how comprehensive the major style guides are, the print version of Chicago runs 1,144 pages, they still can't answer every how-should-I-do-X question that comes up when you're writing. That's particularly true when you're writing about a specialized area, whether it's gardening, ceramics, or snake handling. No one style guide nor dictionary can capture all of the rich terminology we use when we talk about our favorite topics. And that's where house style guides come in. These are supplemental guides that document all the additional style decisions you need to make when you're writing about a very specific topic. Why is it called house style? Think of the four houses in the Harry Potter novels, Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Slytherin, and Hufflepuff. Each embodied distinct values, looks, and attributes. In the same way, your house style reflects the values of your house, your unique company, association, or industry. For example, if you write about baseball, you might note that strikeout is one word, but at bat is hyphenated. You might note that AstroTurf takes a capital A, and you might indicate guidance on how to format box scores. On the other hand, if you write about international finance, your guide might include a big table listing all the different world currencies and what their symbols are. You might list some of the ISO standards related to banking and monetary systems. And if you write about science fiction, your guide might include the correct spelling of author names that could be easily mistyped, such as Ursula K. Le Guin or Liu Zuxin. You might include the names of fictional worlds, such as Azeroth, Midworld, or the Discworld universe. In sum, a house style guide can be a useful supplement to a major style guide like Chicago or AP. It documents all the terms of art and formatting specs used when writing about a particular topic. If you work at a company, the house style guide should be available to everyone who writes for the corporation. But even if you write alone, it can still be helpful to have your own personal house style guide to remember how you like to do things. It can keep you from having to look things up over and over or from having to remake style decisions. And if you're wondering about the capitalization of federal, it's generally lowercase when it's descriptive, like when you're talking about federal laws and federal court and it's capitalized when it's part of the name of an organization like the Federal Bureau of Investigations and the Federal Reserve Board. But the AP Stylebook says it's also capitalized when you're referring to the federal architectural style. So in the example, non-federal sponsors, it's most likely that federal would be lowercase, 
so non in non-federal sponsors, would be lowercase too. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Finally, here's a cute double family story from Texas. Hi, Grammar Girl. Our family story is related to one of our daughters. When she was younger, she had possibly some minor dyslexia. When she was five or so, she wrote her letter to Santa. Dear Santa, please bring me my presents because I have been a very goob girl. So goob has replaced good in our family. It makes us smile. The other story has to do with walking into a Chinese restaurant in Houston. They had a sitting Buddha on the front counter. It was one of the fat Buddhas as opposed to the skinnier version that you generally see in Thailand. She saw it and said, look, there's a Bubba. Same problem, different application. I hope you enjoyed this one. Over and out. Received. Thank you, sir. And if you want to share your family dialect story, the story of a word your family and only your family uses, leave a voicemail at 833214-GIRL, and you might hear it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find me at the home of my podcast network, quickanddirtytips.com. Thank you to my producer, Nathan Sims. And that's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>